in the West Coast Maritime Strike. And for those who don't know, and we'll be talking about it this evening, the ILW was instrumental in using their power to support this strike. And we have longshore workers, Clarence Thomas and others who were here, and their families were in the longshore local. And as a result of a fight by Harry Bridges against racism, African Americans could get good jobs and still have good jobs in San Francisco. So this is a, a very important union in relationship to history of, of working class and the fight against racism uh, in San Francisco and around the country, and it still exists, obviously. A number of speakers uh, are going to talk about their experiences, and one of the things that we want to talk about is the relevance of, the, of that strike today. Even though uh, w the demands we fought for, some of them, Ethnic Studies Department, were were fulfilled, but basically it's not an activist ethnic studies department. Uh, it's not run by activists, it's run by academics, unfortunately. And the demand for open admissions, today the students at San Francisco State are spending thousands and thousands of dollars. They're going into debt uh, and they graduate like paupers. They owe money uh, for their school. And uh, that's something that we fought for, open admissions, free education, which is no longer the case. So it has a lot of uh, relevance today, and I think we'll have some good speakers and lessons uh, from the past for today. First of all, let's give Steve Zeltzer and the Labor Video Project Labor Fest a round of applause for organizing this event tonight. I've got a three-hour speech and five minutes to give it. Um, first of all, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge some people in the room right at this moment, because I stand before you today as being one of the students that were a part of the precursor of the e Economic Educational Opportunity Program, otherwise known as EOP. It was special admit admissions, admittance. And the people who are responsible for my getting into college are here tonight. Brother James Garrett, would you please stand, Jimmy? Also, Brother Benny Stewart. When I came on campus, J Jimmy was the uh, chairman of the Black Student Union, and then Benny became his successor. I was very fortunate to be a part of a class that is very distinguished. People that you know, like Danny Glover, he was a part of that group. Landon Williams, who was a former political prisoner in the Black Panther Party and went on and currently an executive with the San Francisco Foundation. And many, many others, but I just wanted to acknowledge those brothers here. This is a very emotional period and moment for me because I'm a third generation longshore worker. My grandfather came from Shreveport, my maternal grandfather came from Shreveport, Louisiana, joined the ILW in, 19, in 1944. At that time, it was the International Longshore Association. Then in 1963, my father, who had been a postal worker, became a member of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. He passed away in 1985, and I became a member. Talk about a rendezvous with destiny. I had no idea when I was at San Francisco State that I would wind up being a longshore worker. But more importantly, the groundwork for everything that I've done as an activist in the union and in the community, the groundwork was laid at San Francisco State and with the Black Panther Party, but more so with the San Francisco State strike because I was a member of the San Francisco State College Black Student Union Central Committee. At this time, I would like Brother Terry Collins to stand up, please. This is Brother Terry Collins, who is a few years my senior, but he was one of the leading Marxist-Leninist theoreticians who introduced us to, the con to many, many concepts of Marxism-Leninism, specifically around the question of Central Committee and the Presidium, 
and many, many other things as it relates to this discussion and study of protracted struggle, Mao Zedong's works, Lenin's works, because we practice democratic centralism in that organization. But to get to the point of the lessons learned for me, number one, that black people, brown people, People of color have a right to self-determination. What does that mean? That means we have the right to determine our own destiny. That was exemplified by that strike. Brother Terry and I were given the responsibility of framing those demands and coming up with an explanation as to what they meant. I learned how to put together a flyer I learned how to organize on the fly, so to speak. That strike at San Francisco State needs to be put into its proper context because that was the longest student strike in the history of American higher education. It had its impact way beyond what took place at San Francisco State. As I mentioned before, the precursor of the Educational Opportunity Program was started right there at San Francisco State and implemented up and down the coast. I'm going to read something that I think kind of really puts into context what the struggle was all about. One of the most effective confrontations in the history of the United States student movement the San Francisco State College strike will no doubt serve as a precedent for future campus disruption. The strike has been unique in many ways, differing completely from the events at Columbia University in New York and at Cornell and Harvard. The San Francisco strike witnessed the formation of new alliances, the use of new tactics, and the mobilization of unprecedented support. The effectiveness of the strike can be attributed primarily to the leadership of the San Francisco State College Black Student Union. Now, you might think that this comes from a progressive or left-wing publication. Far be it the case. This is excerpted from the riots, civil, and criminal disorder hearings before the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations on Committee on Government Operations, U.S. Senate, 91st Congress, First Session, Part 22, page 571. So that lets you know what the state thought about our struggle and how important it was for them to assess it. What I would like to say now in closing is this. I learned about intersectionality. I learned about working with different groups. I learned about coalition building. But more specifically, I think one of the most powerful things that I learned was the relationship that the students had have to the community. We had a Black Student Union off-campus center that was located in the Fillmore. And as Benny Stewart was so fond of saying that we don't want to go through the rigors of a higher education and then not be able to communicate to our family members when we come out. We believe that it was that the educational system should serve the needs of the community. That was critical. As you saw from that clip, people like Dr. Carlton Goodlett, people like um, former San Francisco State uh, uh, a graduate, Ron Dellums, who went on to be, become a city councilman and a, and a member of Congress and also the mayor of Oakland. These were some of our elders who we struggled with. Yes, we struggled with. Because they were so startled, I guess is the right word, to see how resolute that we were. And the last point I want to make is this. We learned that we could take on the state and win. That is so important for young people
to understand. That's a very, very important. And that propelled me to do everything that I've done with Steve Zeltzer. Things like organizing the Million Worker March in Washington, D.C. in October of 2004. Shutting down the Port of Oakland around the question of justice for Oscar Grant. Shutting down, shutting down the Zim Line, which is the leading shipping company for the state of Israel around the question of the Israeli commandos killing those people that were a part of the humanitarian for Gaza. Shutting down the port around the question of Wall Street on the waterfront, where 40,000 people from the city of Oakland converged on the port of Oakland, shutting it down. Many, many, many other struggles that I've had the great privilege of working with Steve, also with Danny Glover, who's not here tonight because he's in Australia, where he's working with maritime workers and metal workers in Sydney. That's why he's not here tonight. But I'm going to conclude right now because I know my wife is about to give me the cutoff signal. <laughs> but I just wanted to say how great a turnout it is tonight. And I'm glad to see brother and uh, comrade in arms, Roger Alvarado. Uh, Roger, would you please stand up, please? I know you go, I know, see, one of the reasons why I ask brothers to stand up, because we're at the age when, when we can stand up, yeah, we want to be able to demonstrate that we can. But thank you all so much. I've got so many more stories to tell. I, I brought my archives here, not all of them, and I, I have them laminated so people can handle them. But thank you all so much for coming. The 50th anniversary, of the San Francisco state strike was historic. The only thing that I would say in closing that is long overdue for there to be a course at San Francisco State dealing with that struggle. We did not wage that struggle to have a department that is alienated from radicalism, that is alienated from revolution. That's what that was about. That's why we demanded. I was on the Black Studies. I was the coordinator of the Black Studies Committee. I was responsible for being one of the people recruiting Dr. Nathan Hare from Howard University to be our first chairman. That department was expected to be a revolutionary department and not one that's reactionary. So I hope that what, what comes out of this is that we can get some true representation of what that strike truly represented. Thank you so much for your attention. So now that we have some lights, I'm going to ask uh, all the uh, strikers and supporters of the strike to uh, speak, uh, you know, raise your hand and introduce yourself and uh, then we'll, uh, we can record that. Okay, all stand up first. All, if, all the, if you can stand up, all the strikers, you know. <laughs> And, you know, uh, w working on the strike, uh, as I was, I was in SDS, but working on the strike was, uh, and because I was a union worker, a library worker, the union uh, went on strike with the strikers, and as a result of that, the ILWU said we could all go on the docks. And that was a big, big thing for, for particularly workers who needed money to support themselves. So the longshoremen played a critical role, a vital role in actually solidifying with the strikers by allowing them to work on the docks. And I, I think that's what solidarity is about. And that's what we need more of in this country if we're going to survive the attacks that we're facing. So uh, one of the uh, speakers uh, tonight who was uh, involved in helping to plan for the strike and, and getting support of other unions and organizations is uh, Jimmy Garrett. And Jimmy Garrett is going to say a few words. Welcome, Jimmy Garrett. First of all, thank you. I, I don't participate in many of these uh, projects, activities, et cetera. Uh, for one thing, I'm not in the country that much. Um, I want to just take a moment to talk about what I'm engaged in. 
for the last 10 years, I've been working on, uh, I guess what you'd call nation building projects. We've been uh, working to build uh, hospitals in Vietnam and focusing on the problem of Agent Orange. Uh, we know that people protest against it, but we built two hospitals, um, one in Ben An and one near Vung Tau. And we had started uh, a third hospital up where in the area they call uh, uh, Boy Wai, which is where uh, Play Coup, some of you have heard of Play Coup. Uh, that was where major battles were fought in 1967, 68. Uh, but the, uh, the wonderful Clinton people came in to uh, disrupt that because they saw it was going too well. <clears throat> so we're now in Namibia under the auspices of the Southwest African People's Organization, which is the political party in Namibia. And we have joined with the Nujoma family, and we're, the, we're building a hospital there, a hospital and a uh, medical training center. And the hospital is uh, being named after Theophil Theophildine Nujoma, who is the mother of the nation. That is, the hospital is not being named after Sam Nujoma, it's being named after the person it should be named after, and that's uh, uh, his partner and wife. A um, group of us just visited there. They, they live on a cooperative farm um, uh, about 160 miles from Winhoek. The cooperative farm is fully cooperative, and when we met with Sam Nujoma, we had to go out this guy is 85 years old, 86, much older than me, <laughs> not much. <laughs> but he's picking uh, uh, um, coffee beans because he has his daily uh, uh, work to do. Um, much, not much like uh, Marcelino Dos Santos, uh, who was the head of state of Angola. His daughter is the um, third or fourth richest woman in the world. So we chose to go to Namibia because it is considered to be the least corrupt nation uh, in Africa to continue our work. Very quickly, my, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't there for the strike. Um, in May of 1968, um, uh, Willie Brown, Henry Ramsey, and Clint White worked out with my judge in a case that I had been involved in. I had a mild altercation with the San Francisco police. And um, I was given five years in prison or five years restricted probation. I could not enter the San city and county of San Francisco as of May 28th, 1968. <clears throat> to roll back a little bit, I mean, some people thought that I must be a police agent because I wasn't at the strike. <laughs> um, in any case, that happened. That, in those days, that was part of the ritual. The ritual of COINTELPRO was to uh, uh, feel that if subjectively, if a person wasn't satisfying your needs, then they must be an agent because that's what COINTELPRO taught. And <clears throat> I came to San Francisco State in, 19, in, in December of 65. But my understanding of San Francisco uh, was a result of a study that me and a sister by the name of Pamela Igashira, who had, was born in a concentration camp uh, as, a, as an American citizen. Uh, she was born in a concentration camp in the US and was more, much more cold-blooded cold black nationalist than I ever became. This Japanese uh, woman was hard line, the hardest line, uh, <laughs> um, one of the hardest line people I'd, I'd ever met. Anyway, we came up to San Francisco together based on a project, and the project was intentionally to see if it was possible to build a black student organization on a white college campus. So the first thing that had to be done was to study the terrain. And we went back all the way back to what we could find about the history of San Francisco. And of course, labor and work and the struggle between uh, capitalism and labor uh, power is consistent with the history of anybody's development and is particularly consistent with San Francisco. 
So we trace the history of first San Francisco, uh, California and its development, then San Francisco, and then the two uh, uh, nodes of, of uh, the black population on Hunters Point, where, which was an intentional community set up by the US Navy to house people who were going to engage in the building of, of ships. And that's a long struggle. That's what I, I would have called this thing that I'm just talking about very quickly, the, the struggle to build unity between black people, the Black Student Union, the strike, and the union movement. Because it's not all pure. For example, uh, in, in Hunters Point, blacks had work, but they could never move up the ladder because it basically is controlled by the boiler, play, uh, boiler workers union, was the most dominant union and would not allow blacks to come in. So the IBEW, uh, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, built a coalition among black workers to create a, a council so that black workers could enter in through the side door into the unions. And so they, a number of them entered into the unions. Certainly we could look at the piece, piece again with uh, Harry Bridges who uh, through this research that some of us are doing, I mean, Harry Bridges went to black churches, pool halls, to recruit blacks to come into the union because they didn't believe it. They didn't believe that somebody would be that open to demand, here's you got your shot. I mean, and people in the black community know what it meant when you say you got your shot. The sacrifices that some of the union people in the ILWU made one needs to understand, well, you know, that's, if, if you, you're all union people, you know that you have, to have, you have your book. And so somebody else, you have to sponsor someone else to come in and to work under your book. And to give up that time and to give up that money to allow blacks to work through so that they could build, get to the point where they could become a part of the union. See, I'm deal, not dealing with just the conceptual piece of it, just the day-to-day -day struggles of making a decision that you're going to set aside a week or a month of your own income so that someone from the outside could come in and become a brother or sister with you. That is how I look at the ILWU. Uh, uh, I look at it in a sort of different way. Very quickly, with regard to the union movement and building Black Student Union. Look, from my perspective, my opinion was that a, there were two levels, so pro, uh, profound levels. One was to build, uh, uh, to, in, to bring as many black students on the campus, and then finally Latino camp, <laughs> Asians and everybody else on the campus, so that we, there would be a critical mass of people on the campus again. It was mentioned in this, in this little movie that the percentage of blacks went from 11% to 3%, and uh, we brought that back up by the time I left in, the, in, this, in, uh, in, in uh, May of 68, we had brought that back up to about 9%, and with the cumulative uh, 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 people coming in from various ethnic groups, we had really cut into, we had about 3,000 New students. So first we had a critical mass. The second was to train the purpose, main purpose, was to take that critical mass as it was coming in and train them as cadre. That was, we saw San Francisco State as low-hanging fruit. It claimed to be a li liberal institution, so we snatched it as a liberal institution and use it as a beachhead to train and educate cadre for the specific purpose of serving the long-term interests of whatever communities that people came from. Question was, how, how do we relate to workers? Well, uh, there, most of the people who work at San Francisco State were working class. It was, it was not a, a, a rich campus. 1960, when students uh, demonstrated at, uh, at the anti-HUEC rallies, it turned out that almost all of them were leaving their jobs. They weren't leaving the campus. They were leaving their jobs to go and demonstrate against the House Un-American Activities Committee. And they went to jail and lost jobs through that process. So we, it was a working class uh, community. But what comes out of that was a kind of a liberal coalition that develops out of the HUAC. That's how Slate develops. That's how the tutorial program develops, which was there when I got there. That's how the uh, community involvement program, which was kind of an Alinsky-esque, Saul Alinsky-style organizing uh, a base. But we had to pinpoint each one of those, those institutions on the campus 
and then seize them. Work study. Oh, man. Work study move people. There had been, been struggles in the early 60s to create jobs at Bank of America and Macy's and, and, and on Automobile Row with the uh, ad hoc committee against, uh, racial, against discrimination and, and the Congress of Racial Equality. And then over in San Francisco, Congress of Racial Equality, C.L. Dellums, Ron, not Ron Dellums, C.L. Dellums, wow. right? The uh, uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters was the main, the main organizer in, the, at, at the, uh, uh, in San Francisco. And that's the guy who helped build the, the, the union local for the, uh, uh, the uh, ILWU in Oakland. So he, this is one union supporting another union, black-led union supporting at that time a white-led union. That's the reciprocity. <clears throat> so for us, in, many, in some of our instances, as we brought students on the campus, trained them as not only send them to to classes to help build their, their capacity. We also, what we found is that as we involved students, Raja Alvarado was, was the first person who I hooked up with on a coalition to when we sent George Murray over to work with him on the summer, the tutorial program in the summer of 1966. As we sought out allies early, we sought out allies in the library in the cafeteria, buildings and grounds, janitors. Our position was, every, we didn't have an exclusive club, we were a union, but the union stated this, everyone who defined themselves as a black person on the campus was by definition a member of the Black Students' Union. Was by definition. So the thing was to seek them out where they were, work with them, support their efforts. I'll take this last piece. In, in, in November 6, there were several people involved in an altercation at San Francisco State, which uh, I'm not going to name anybody, my brother. <laughs> the Gator Institute, I didn't want to name it because I might be pointing out somebody who might have been involved. But <clears throat> there was an altercation in which a number of black students were, were um, um, uh, involved. And they were suspended. A month later, on December 6th, the first attempt to close the campus down took place. And we pulled a number of people, people from the Mission Rebels, a glide into that very small, much smaller demonstration, put a lot of youth on the campus. The youth got into fights with the people from the, from, from the, uh, at, from the athletic uh, department. Some of the some cops came on. We couldn't get we, didn't, we could not build, we did not have a, a good relationship with the teachers. And the reason I think was partly because we, by that time, had about 300 people involved in tutorial programs whose job it was to supplement the work of those teachers. So we had struggles over what was, what was the dynamic? February 1968, right? The United Educators had a one day strike in San Francisco. And we closed down the Black Student Union to send the students out from the Black Student Union to accept at churches and, and, and recreation centers and settlement houses students from all over the city so that their parents could go to work. So there was a one-day strike. We placed ourselves under the leadership of the United Educators, that is the Teachers Union. What is that? What, what, anybody know what the local is? Yes, 61. Thank you, ma'am. Um, dementia's kicking in quick. Uh, uh, so in, in, sept in, in the December of, of, of uh, 67, we did not have the teachers. But after that February involvement and coalition and unity, I mean, teachers won tremendous victory from that one, one day strike. What's, the community could support the strike because their children were safely ensconced and associated with people from the Black Student Union. So that linkage helps to create the condition so that in November of 1968, among the first group that goes out in support of the strike are the United Educators, Local 61. 
So for, for me, the question of the union movement and its relationships is a struggle. There's no, that's, I mean, I don't think there's absolute sweetness and light on either side. The problem is that we are human beings involved in a social effort to create the condition where our self and kind can develop to our full human potential. And there's going to be selfishness, there's going to be struggles, there are going to be uh, 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 wrapped uh, marginalizations, they're going to be coming together. But we're involved in a, in a fight against a, a powerful foe. Right now it's called uh, on one, one end, uh, global capitalism, uh, neoliberalism, and on the other side is maverick capitalism, this, this kind of neo-fascist murderous ho ho uh, horde, and they seem to be doing a pretty good job of fighting each other, but in the end, they would come together around a program of destroying us. In, 19, in the 1960s, uh, the national government made, government made political decisions that wherever they, whenever a particular community reached a certain percentage of people of color, particularly blight, uh, black people, that was called a blighted community. The decisions were in each one of those cases to, uh, to engage in what the Haitians called the decoucage the uprooting of those populations, the ethnic cleansing of those populations so that their lives would be better the rendering of them homeless so that their lives could be better. What, one of the man negative manifestations of that were uh, the funding, the providing funds of various local organizations. I mean, you had WAPAC and Waco people fighting each other. That is two major, and I know people don't like to talk about that, two major, organiz major community organizations in battle against one another over, over this. But the end product was essentially the ethnic cleansing of the black community, Fillmore. A number of those people were, were flushed out over into an enclave at Hunters Point, which was itself deteriorating and never has advanced because it has been strangled, it's been starved, it's been raped and pillaged for the past 70 years. Same thing, ha different thing, ha same thing happened in a different way in Oakland. It's happening right now. Um, I live about 100 yards from the original headquarters of the Black Panther Party. It used to be called West Oakland, and had a lot of names. I, I live two houses from uh, Martin Luther King and, and uh, uh, 59th Street. That's where I live. And I've been there 17 years. Um, when I moved on the block, there was a, a woman who was the mayor of the block. Um, there are 32 houses on the block. When I first moved on, on there, there were uh, 27 or 28 black or black and mixed uh, families. Now, there are two. The value of my house has uh, increased fourfold. And w when I got it, it wasn't worth what I was paying for it. So it's a false market but people are streaming into that false market. And I think, and that's again, it's my opinion, that that's partly because of the flow of capitalism. You flush all the whites out to the far hinterlands, but you can't stop there because that stuff will begin to get stilted. Capitalism has to keep moving. It has to be, it has to be oppressing somebody in some ways at all times. And um, the gentrification that's happening in in my area where I live in Oakland is stark, but it's happening all over the country the same way the program of blighted areas happened all over the country. Here's our problem with black studies. Our problem with black studies, ethnic studies or Africana studies or whatever, is that that break that, 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 that was mentioned uh, by Buzz a few minutes ago, that break from, from its purpose, its goal of black studies has created a condition where the top scholars who work in these programs, they don't not, not only know about the strike or about the building of the Black Student Union, which took years to build. The strike 
wasn't two elephants bumped asses and there was a strike that popped out of it. That was a history that came to it. And that's one of the things to me is really undialectical is to start the movement with the strike when in some ways the movement stopped with the strike. <clears throat> at least at San Francisco State because it killed all the programs that uh, was, were um, uh, put in place. But the, the scholars, uh, black academics, I'll just, I won't talk about anybody else. Black academics is structured around engaging in study that either interests them or interests the academy. Now, black radical revolutionary scholar starts with trying to identify what are the issues, problems, dynamics, programs that exist for the population, for the masses of the people, and then put in that intellectual labor to help construct those, to help clarify, to help guide and direct people so that they can change their own condition. I mean, that's why I went to state I didn't go to state to, to be the head of black student union or be the head of black studies, but to organize people to build their own organization, to build strong people so that they could build their own organization. If a black scholar's life is dealing with the intellectual, the, the intersectionality of their own sex life, and that is the focus of their study, it's an interesting piece to that scholar. But these, the scholars in ethnic studies, the scholars in black studies, they, they have their jobs not because of doing something that they just found interesting. <laughs> they were involved, they were, they, the reason that they have jobs at all is because some people gave up their lives, their eyes, their faces, their careers in order to, create, in order to establish a, a context where people could train and prepare to serve the interests of the people. Last piece, there's something called, and a lot of people don't know about it, how did the issue around black studies become a campus-wide issue? In late February, early March, a document was presented to the Faculty Senate, well, it was first, it was presented to Fred Thalheimer. Most of you guys don't know him, he's, okay, that's too bad. <laughs> 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 Only 50. Fred Thalheimer, who was the person that we tr trusted more than anybody else at that time. And Fred Thalheimer read through the document. The Black Student Union edited the document that me and Pam wrote. That was called a, a uh, it was a presentation to the Faculty Senate for them to adopt a project called a Black Study and Community Work program. That was in February of 1967. Of course, uh, Nathan came in 68. That was a year's work that went into that to get it to the point where somebody as brilliant as Nathan could, could construct it and put it in a systematic way. But Nathan would not have come to the campus had he thought it was going to be a campus academic program. What drew him to the campus was not that everybody was cute at San Francisco State. What drew him to the campus was this was an opportunity to actually build a campus, a series of campuses, a series of nodes in the community, and use the campus as one site of intellectual endeavor. And the purpose of it was to train people for long-term struggle. That I wanted to put out to you. The support that the campus faculty AFT gave in that early days is what helped us to ride through to get to the point where a year and a half later that could be a strike. Those AFT people, many of whom lost their jobs later on during the strike, but those AFT people were key to keeping the process going. A lot of times we like to see ourselves at the center. In fact, we don't want to struggle unless we're at the center of it. But there were so many forces involved in this process that it might be useful to at least uh, acknowledge that uh, other people's relationship to it, other than the people who 
sometimes we project as being heroes of it because sometimes the heroes are the people who are the least known of all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, our next speaker is uh, Roger Alvarado, who is one of the leaders of the strike. You want to come up, Roger, and say a few words? World Third World Liberation Front. Roger? Welcome, Roger Alvarado. To me, uh, what I think I learned at a very early age is that uh, rich people are rich because they have a lot of people working to make them that. And the foundation of anybody's wealth is their capacity to work, be productive, and to share the products of their labor uh, with, 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 with others. I, uh, I always identified San Francisco State as essentially a working class school. Had a tremendous amount of people that were coming in uh, from outlying areas. A lot of people who came from working class families who identified with uh, working class people, with unions, and had some sense of social consciousness. The histories of our time uh, go back before the strike, go back before World War II, go back to uh, immigrants coming to this country and essentially being used, abused, and manipulated by the uh, so-called leadership to make whatever this country is uh, in terms of what its, produ its productivity, its product, and really uh, never given the kind of respect and acknowledgement uh, that so constantly is proclaimed uh, publicly. Uh, it, the leadership of this country is dis a disgrace and it's something that uh, we cannot uh, vilify enough in order to really appreciate the extent to which they have denied the builders of the wealth of this country. When this country can go to war after 9-11, completely destroy a nation, put together the foundation for the resentment, subjugation of a whole religious group, and then turn around and deny them access to participate here. That, that is, that's, that's, for me, it's probably one of the best examples of the extent to which this country's leadership uh, has defiled uh, the role of leadership in its willingness to just debase anybody and everybody for their own self-interest. Going back to San Francisco State, no, it wasn't the strike. And it wasn't the campus in the 60s. It was all the generations that came together in the Bay Area at that time and their history, the labor struggles in San Francisco, the migration of all, all people of color to, 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 to the Bay Area, you know, uh, whether it's the uh, Asians or Mexicans, or blacks, you know, uh, Probably one of the few, probably in San Francisco, the Bay Area was a, is a great example of a real uh, influx of various peoples and traditions, cultures, languages, that I think set it up to make possible our ability to appreciate what was happening and how to recognize the realities of it. So by the time we get to being in school in the 60s, it's the whole development of the civil rights movement, the black civil rights movement in the South that is, that is coming to the fore. It's the apartheid in Africa that's going on. It's the war in Vietnam, which continues to escalate and, and dig deeper and deeper into everyday lives. 
that makes it possible for us to appreciate and understand uh, what the black struggle was about, to appreciate the importance of participating, not only in terms of support, but in being able to recognize ourselves in what was being discussed. When Malcolm X presents the notion of self-determination, it literally cut through so many different people's lives in being able for them to finally understand what it was in de defining what they were looking for, to realize a piece that they were not understanding about their identifying their own particular needs and how to go about uh, establishing them. The school was, was unusual in, in one particular aspect, and that was the amount of work that the students were involved in doing on all various levels, and things that concerned their own personal interests in regards to evaluating faculty and, and, and sharing that evaluation among the student body, to involving themselves in various communities through tutorial programs, community involvement programs, work study programs, establishing a thing called Experimental College, and being able to use all of these vehicles to explore ways in which people could relate from an institution into communities and find ways in which we could be productive and be able to understand our communities and identify what their needs were so that we could come back to the institution, take the notion of self-determination, and begin to ask the question of what is the role of the institution in relation to our communities? I mean, when you look at who's paying for everything that's going on, it's not the rich people. It's the people who are working every friggin' day. And we are the people who are paying for this, what's happening, and we are the last ones who have anything to say about it. If there is a democracy in this country, it's corporate democracy. And if you do not have the identification of a corporate citizenship, you are just an ordinary citizen, and you don't say shit. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you're bought and paid for by the same corporate citizen. You perform, when they call, you answer. Us, when we call, we get the recording. We'll, we'll, be right, we'll get back to you any day, any day now. Long story short, if, if we don't understand the history before the strike, we don't understand the strike. If we, okay, some of us, when we got to school, when school and it's, it's the School of Third World Studies. There was an aspect about that where we, the school was gonna be absorbed by the institution. And what's, it's what the institution does. It's why it's an institution. It's why it exists. It's there to co-opt. It's there to absorb. It's, there, it, it's, it's the critique of pure tolerance, right? The more you tolerate something, the more you have a capacity to tolerate something, the more you can absorb. You can pull in all the different tang tangled parts of it, and you can just weave it back into the, another shape and form and regurgitate it out so that it's what you want it to represent. It's not what it was meant to be. If we are going to do something, and we want, the, we want a thing to become more than what we were capable of, then we need to see a participation by everybody in the, involved in that, and a demand by people to see that they, that they be respected for their contributions, and appreciate the fact that collectively we are financing what's going on, and that we need to realize our voice needs to matter. And the only ones that can do that for us are ourselves. We need to engage, dialogue, and continue to exchange with those who don't want to listen to us, as well as with those we hear too much from already. We need to extend ourselves and uh, share. share. Share among ourselves what we're giving up and letting the rich people have for nothing, right? We're, this, is, this, is, this is not us. This is not what we're about. This is not why we work. This is not why we have our families. We are not here to be manipulated and run into the ground and to have other people run into the ground in our name. That's beyond being insulting. It's unworthy.
this struggle, uh, the role of women was very important. Women workers who supported, as uh, was pointed out by Jimmy, the teachers, which are taking us up a struggle today in San Francisco, where there's a racist campaign against African American teachers. Latino teachers are being driven out. There's a program called PAR, Peer Assisted Review, which is used to target senior teachers, to get rid of senior workers. And this is what's going on in capitalism today among public workers, to get rid of senior workers, African American, Latino workers, to destroy that workforce. Uh, and, and basically, all the, many of the gains of African American, Latino came from public services, from the post office, from uh, US government jobs and, and other jobs. And they're under attack now, right here in San Francisco. So uh, our next speaker, Judy Juanita, who was then Judy Hart, and she was a, an activist in the strike. Welcome. Judy Hi, and to all my friends, people I know, some hello. I'm glad to see you again after 50 years, 40 years. Okay, and Roger was my boss at one point. I don't know if you remember me, but I was, uh, I ran the tutorial center in Potrero Hill. So my um, father, Albert Haywood Hart, uh, migrated in the 1930s here from Oklahoma, and he uh, joined the army the day after Pearl Harbor, and then was immediately sent to Tuskegee, and he became a Tuskegee Airman. He came back, of course, after the war, and settled here with my mother, and my siblings and I were born here. He also worked a lot on the uh, on the uh, on the waterfront, he never was a B man. But I have his book; um, it's a memento that I keep, you know, of him. So, so my parents were part of that uh, wave of people from the South, of African Americans from the South, who came to California um, d before and during World War II for jobs in the shipyards. My mom was a, a 40 year and a gold watch um, employee, civil servant. Um, she said she was too um, shy to be a teacher, which she had a degree from Langston in. So Langston was also Dr. Hare's school. So Langston was where my mother and father met. So, <clears throat> I started school at Oakland City College, and um, I was Judy Hart then, and I encountered, um, um, I, I was 16 when I started school there, which is a normal um, age for students, many teachers know, for students to go to community college, we either have we were too advanced or we were not advanced enough, we dropped out and we just started at the uh, community college. So I met Huey and Bobby there when I was 16. So I ended up then, um, decades later, writing a novel called Virgin Soul, which is about a young black woman who enters uh, college, community college, Oakland City College, and um, becomes an accidental radical just by being around a lot of radical forces. So I transferred to San Francisco State in uh, January 66, um, and I encountered the Negro Students Association, I believe it was called. And um, I'd like to stand here and represent, if I may, a lot of women who were active at every single stage of development at San Francisco State at, with the Soul Students Advisory Council at um, Merritt College, which Oakland City College became. We were there every step of the way. Um, you, uh, I'd like to mention that Clarence Thomas uh, is my first husband. I don't have a second one. Um, you know, but uh, Mary, Mary, Mariana Wadi, Maryam, Maryam Awadi, okay, and Trish Rivara, 
and I were all very active in getting the name changed. We were right there attending the meetings you, from the Negro Students Association to the Black Student Union. Um, thank you for your history. I didn't know all of it. I appreciate it though. But we were there. We were present every, with every development. Okay, um, and I outline a great deal of that in my book, Virgin Soul, but I had to make a choice in that book uh, in, uh, because it got too unwieldy uh, in dealing with either uh, the Black Panther Party, which I was a part of, or the, um, the Black Student Union at San Francisco State. So it, it came down to, to being, uh, the focus was more on the Black Panther Party. Uh, but I just wanted to, to, to add that and also to say that an important part of the struggle at that point that I, I write about in my latest book, I'm always going to push my books, homage, homage to the Black Arts Movement, a handbook, I'm Judy Juanita. Uh, I'm, I'm a worker bee and I w always want to represent the worker bee. The, the person no one mentions, people don't know who you are, they don't know your name, and that's all right, because we're not doing it to be mentioned. We're doing, my roommates and I, when we joined all of these things, the Negro Students Association, the Black Student Union, the Black Panther Party, which we were the first five women from San Francisco State to join the party. We did it because it was fun. We did it because it was exciting. We were 20 years old. You know, this was, this was, this was the hap. And, and, that, and of course, we had a consciousness because all of our parents were working class, working to middle class parents. And um, so I wanted to, to make that clear that uh, we, um, we had that solidarity uh, with everyone else, but it was because we had um, a consciousness that came from our parents and our parents' struggle uh, here in the Bay Area. So, okay, thank you. Uh, struggle brought together all kinds of people. And as, I, as mentioned earlier, the, the AFT was very important uh, at San Francisco State in going out on strike and getting the support of the, of the Labor Council in San Francisco. And, and you wonder, Reagan wanted to bring in the National Guard. If he'd had his choice, he would have done that. Uh, he would have brought in the National Guard and just taken over the campus. But I think, you know, one of the reasons he was unable to do that was the unions, including the ILWU, and the unions were supporting the strike. And that would have led to probably a mass labor confrontation. And there's one thing that the capitalists are afraid of in this country, and that's a general strike. There was one in 1934. They don't want another general strike because a general strike is a, a vehicle for all working people to come together and show their power collectively. And it's a frightening thing for the capitalist class to see a united front of the entire working class. This is, I think, what we have to push for, and this is one of the reasons we have Labor Fest because the reason that strike was successful is it brought together the entire working class and allowed hundreds of thousands of workers to join unions. The bosses, the capitalists were afraid of firing workers if they join a union. Now workers are fired left and right. Thousands and thousands of workers are fired every year who try to join unions. So this issue of building in the working class and the trade union movement a, a, a collective power is one of the tasks we had then and one of the tasks we had now uh, to defend ourselves. And I think uh, Trump is doing a good job, you know, in one way, in attacking everyone, African-American, Latino, Asians, immigrants. Uh, it's dangerous, these racist attacks that are going on, escalating in this country. Uh, uh, a Latino man, 91 year, years old, was attacked with a brick, two bricks, you know, he nearly died. This is what we have in this country now. This is a, a frightening thing, a terrifying thing, and that's why what, the building of a working class movement is critical, a mass movement to stop these attacks, to defend the entire working class. This is a life and death issue. So uh, I wanted to invite, I don't know if he, can, he wants to say anything, Anatole Anton, who was a member of the AFT and was involved in SDS and the strike. You want to say a few words, Anatole? Are you up to? I, uh, I don't know what I have to add to what's been said already that's good. 
Yeah, I said I don't know what I have to add that hasn't been said already that uh, is good, but I want to reaffirm everything that was said and think that we should work on building a working class party. Um, I, We have two people here who have been involved in it uh, for, for many years. I mean, think about this, uh, this, uh, this ongoing scandal in San Francisco, uh, which is a national scandal. A billion dollars has been spent to supposedly remediate, clean up Hunters Point Bayview and Treasure Island. And all the testing was faked because rich capitalists want to build condos there. And they're driving the community out, African-American community. I mean, think of a billion dollars. And in this last reconciliation budget, uh, Pelosi got another $42 million to do more testing. You know, that they can't, they can't even sell the homes now because people realize that they're contaminated. There's radiation and poison. And the San Francisco Bayview black community paper, one of the few, has been telling the truth for decades. Uh, a hemp supporter, Shumshai, and others have been saying that this is dangerous, it's killing people. 50% of the kids have asthma. So this struggle right now is kind of exploding. And it involves the entire capitalist system, the capitalist politicians, Pelosi, Feinstein, Kamala Harris, Willie Brown, all of them are personally involved in this scandal because they knew what was going on and whistleblowers were fired for speaking out about the falsification of the testing. So there are two people here who are, have been involved in that in San Francisco for many, many years. Uh, Ray, Dr. Ray Tompkins, and, who's a striker, and also Cheryl Thornton, who worked at the Petrell Hill uh, Neighborhood Health Center, which now they want to shut down, and she was removed uh, from improperly. So why don't you both come up and talk about your struggle today uh, to protect the community residents and also to, to defend African-American workers who are uh, coming under attack. So can you come up here? Hello, everyone. So my name is Cheryl Thornton. And um, so, <laughs> so um, I'll just tell you a little bit about my story. So my name is Cheryl Thornton, and I've served the beautiful Patrol Hill community for 20 plus years. For 20 plus years, I've gladly and proudly worked with the residents of Patrol Hill at the Patrol Hill Health Clinic. Um, although I've never lived in the community, I've always felt I was a part of the community. I support patients in navigating the oftentimes challenging healthcare system, and I've, I've had support, I've supported the youth in navigating educational opportunities for their futures. In many ways, I've been a dedicated contributor and advocate for the marginalized public housing community. Recently, I was a whistleblower for the city and county of San Francisco. Um, and um, I complained about falsification of time reporting. Additionally, I filed a grievance about pay inequity in inaccurate job descriptions. I also had a lawsuit regarding harassment in the workplace, which I won. After my lawsuit, I was demoted and all of my supervisorial and managerial duties were removed. I was told that the reason that this was happening was because of personnel issues. Since then, the city has refused to provide data about employment practices unless the union gets a lawyer. So um, I worked in the clinic for many years and the reason that the harassment started is because I was supporting marginalized people in the public housing um, community. Many times patients would come in, they'd be sick, and this is the only health care they had access to, living on the hill, because in um, marginalized communities, lots of times the public transportation is not great. And living up there on that hill, it's hard for a lot of people to get out. If you get off the hill, if you see the terrain up there, it's very hilly, it's very steep. 
And prior to this health clinic being built in the 70s, the only health care that was available for a lot of the people in District 10 was San Francisco General Hospital emergency room. There was no primary care clinics. And so the residents of the public housing in District 10, Patrol Hill and Bayview Hunters Point, they went to Washington, D.C. to get funding. So this clinic, Patrol Hill, was the first primary care clinic in District 10. And I, um, as a youth, became familiar with the clinic because my dad started working there when it opened. He was a dentist. So basically, my career started there really in high school as a volunteer. So the community was different than it is now because there's been a lot of gentrification that has happened. People are being forced out because they want to build expensive condos there. And, but I want to tell you, there were a lot of people that came to the clinic that were sick from just living in the area from all the toxins. They got sick with cancer, diabetes, mental illness, all kinds of things. Um, so again, this clinic was important. But because a lot of the patients that lived, that used the clinic in community, that came from the community, they really didn't know how to navigate the system. But because I had um, background, you know, I had a good medical, I, uh, just knowing about how to, the healthcare system work, I had a pretty strong background. So I advocated for um, the residents to get healthcare. And a lot of the people that work in the clinics, they're resistant to having people have health care because they're so sick, it's very taxing on the doctors. And so they don't really know how to do what, to, they know what to do, but it's just so overwhelming to them. Um, and it's that access has been, is really limited. For example, if maybe a patient was 15 minutes late or 20 minutes late, they'd be told they'd have to schedule another appointment. But yet when patients come to a public health clinic, sometimes they're sitting in the lobby for two hours or more to see their doctor. No respect for the patients. So I really start advocating for people, having them fill out grievances, things like that. Because you know when Obamacare came online, one of the things that was mandated in Obamacare was that you have to create a patient advisory council, that you have to have a mechanism for patients to grieve. And if there's too many grievances at a public health clinic, they could actually lose their Medi-Cal licensing or be investigated. So this is why I was thrown out of the clinic, because I was helping patients advocate for their rights, and there were many complaints filed on that health center at 1050 Wisconsin. So they had me removed from the health center, and they told me that the reason that I was being removed from the community health center is because um, I had his institutional knowledge that no one else had, and that I would be better served in the health center, I mean, in the call center, um, trying to get patients who've never been in our system, who didn't want to come to our system, to get them to come in versus advocating for the marginalized people in Portrayal Hill. Now, uh, currently, um, the public housing that is there in Portrayal Hill were some families who came there in the 30s who were only supposed to be there temporarily ended up there many generations. Now, because the land is so valuable in San Francisco, that nine acres of public housing land is being condensed down to three acres for public housing units. And the other six are gonna be affordable housing and open market condos because Patrol Hill has some of the best weather and it has some of the best views. And, it's, and because land is in such a demand in San Francisco, 
that this is what's happening, the gentrification. So I was also removed from that clinic, I believe, because I was organizing the community so that they could fight for their rights and telling them, educating them on where you could go to file a complaint to get help. And that's not what they wanted. These city officials, these powers to be, they want that land and they want to disorganize and gentrify that community. So um, the interesting thing is, I want to tie this to San Francisco State <laughs> because when this first happened, we were, um, and they said they were going to remove me from the clinic, I said, okay, I got with some of my other SEIU 10 to 1 coworkers. They said, we're going to stand behind you. This is unfair. This is unjust. What's happening to you, Cheryl? There's no reason that this should be happening. So my union didn't know what to do, and I said, well, I know what to do. Let's have a rally. So on March 28th, we had our first rally about all of this. But prior to having that rally and preparing for it, I went to San Francisco State to the Ethnic Studies Department because my first thought was, we need to get the young people involved so that they can know because this is an attack on public services. And what I had been hearing going to the Labor Council and places that San Francisco State was under attack, that it's being privatized. And I said that we need to educate our young people about these services, these public services that we've had to fight for for many, for I guess the last 50 years, they're now disappearing. It, these public services made it possible for marginalized people of color to achieve middle class uh, status through this kind of employment, these services. But now they're being taken away. So I said, I need to go to San Francisco State. So somehow I just, you know, I didn't know anybody there, but I just jumped on the phone and the internet. And next thing you know, I made contact with the professor at Ethnic Studies. And she invited me to come to talk about the struggle. So I decided, because it was early in the org organizing phases, I didn't have a lot of people. This was just this year. I took Reverend Amos Brown with me from the NAACP. So we went around from classroom to classroom trying to educate the youth about what is happening even at San Francisco State and that we need everybody to get involved in this city because the services are under attack. So it was interesting because actually the students there, they don't understand the short span of time that all this has actually occurred from this strike 50 years ago until now, from the right to vote 50 years ago until now, they seem to take this for granted. And when we were out talking to the students, they didn't understand what privatization was. This is here at San Francisco State now. They don't really understand. They think that there they they think that there's racism. They think that there's discrimination, but they don't really think that it's happening to them. But one thing when I was at San Francisco State that I learned the short time I was there, there were a lot of students complaining about the disparity of how the teachers treated especially the black students at San Francisco State, especially how they tried to steer them away from the STEM, um, the STEM, the, the, the disciplines that are in STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and math, how when they go to the professors to ask for help, how they're turned away even though they're going for office hours. And I said, aha, see this is where it's, it, they're already experiencing this same discrimination that they're going to experience in the workplace, but they didn't realize what they don't realize. So anyway, I haven't been back to San Francisco State yet again because I've been dealing with um, organizing through the union my own struggle because 
I'm actually trying to get myself back to Patrol Hill Health Center to work in that community. And the reason I want to go back to the community is because, first of all, those people, they came to bat for me. When this all happened, there were patient advisors, people from the community that wrote letters, and they went and they demonstrated with me. And it meant a lot to me that they did that, that they cared and they recognized that I really was there for them. And I don't do this job to get rich or anything like that. I do it because I want to make a difference in people's lives. I'm sorry. And so, and so I want to say that um, it's been a struggle and we had a lot of actions and we're still having actions. And I've been to the Labor Council and I've had a lot of support tremendous support and um, but somehow I feel that this is happening to me it's ha it's happening not only to me but many others but sometimes things happen to people who have the resiliency and the resistance um, to stand up and do something and so what I realized in all of this is that San Francisco says that it's a liberal and progressive city. But it's not really. Because the black population has gone down from 18% in the 70s to now less than 3.9%. And that was not, that's not, a, that's just not something that just happened. It's plan gentrification that's happening. And because they need the land, and because it's about white supremacy, and that we don't, now that the city is built, now that the shipyards are closed, and now that we're either dead or we're here, we're not allowed to have equal education. The education system in the public schools is outrageous. The African American students are so far behind, there's a disparity. There's a disparity in the number of years that black people live in this city. The average black person in San Francisco lives 15 years less than anybody else, and it's because of the racism and the oppression. They keep telling us it's because of the food that we eat. It's not just the food, it's the racism that's killing us. And San Francisco is fake and phony. It's not a progressive city. It's the most racist city in, in the United States because anytime you have a population go from 18% to less than 4%, there is a problem. And if you watch in the 60s, there was a filmmaker, James Baldwin. He came, I don't know if you guys have seen it, and he made a movie about San Francisco, Take This Hammer. And in the 60s, when the population was at 20%, you saw black people talking about, I can't get jobs. My education is not of the same quality as everybody else. I don't have decent housing. I don't have decent access to health care. I can't, I don't have a decent supermarket in my neighborhood. All the same things were happening. And now you see the result here in 2018 when there's less than 3%. In five years, there's probably going to be 1% because the people that do live here, that own homes, that do live here, they're older. And as they pass away, new people can't come here. So I feel like even though what happened to me was horrible, how they slandered and maligned me and got me out of that health center and ru tried to ruin my reputation, I am going to stand up and fight. And I'm fighting for all the people that are coming behind me. And I think that we all need to unify and organize because it's not only an attack on African-American and people, it's an attack on all, 
all social, all economic social classes here who are middle class or less are under threat in this city. And if it happens to one group, it's going to happen to all of us. So I just want to say that um, we need to all, I'm glad you guys are here and you're involved in the struggle and I can hear the story because the struggle started 50 years ago and you've been in the struggle. But I just want to see how we can build a stronger network, a platform to protest what's happening in the city and county of San Francisco to all people. And the way that we can do that is um, our union, because of our actions that we have had, we um, are going to be having a public hearing on this systemic discrimination in this city. And it's gonna be on September 5th at City Hall. And I would like to email everybody because we need everybody to come down there and testify or stand with us in solidarity and say that we need our city back. This is not the San Francisco that we want. It's we, we, the San Francisco is no longer for sale to the developers. We must take our city back. So thank you. Good evening. It's good. Oh, Buzz. Do you remember me? I used to be a lot skinnier. <laughs> me over there in the bungalows. Me, Max, Cookie Man. Lord, I forget. I forget. Time takes you on. You forget. I remember folks by their nicknames. Can't remember their straight up names. We used to help y'all get the Black Fire newspaper out. We would be that team that went around and like Christopher Columbus discovered America, well, we went around the office and discovered all the supplies that y'all need to get the paper out. <laughs> what Malcolm said, by any means necessary, I was creative in that aspect. I happen to be the, as some of the stories and seeing the film, seeing old friends on that film, uh, knowing that some of them are no longer with us, and I'm glad you mentioned Sister Mary Ann Awadi, because she'd tell you she was a mother of black studies. She would not, <laughs> if you didn't, you'd get jacked up. If you didn't, if you were part of it, you'd get jacked up. Um, I happen to be the third chairman of the Black Students Union after Benny. I kind of refer it to as the Reconstruction period after the war. Uh, Jimmy Garrett, it was, prior to the war and the development. It's an evolutionary process. And as some talked about our parents and during the struggles for World War II, it's, an ev it's a continuum. It doesn't stop. And part of the strike and what we're engaged in this whole oh, pedagogy in terms of a philosophical development and how we approach education was supposed to be incorporated within your life. And you make it a part of your life. You just don't, that's the thing I'm doing for now, and don't bring it on. And some of you I've had the privilege throughout my life to see that you have internalized that. And those principles we fought for and stood for has become part of your life. And in my case, both international and domestic, I have made that. And as some, um, my parents, my mother uh, came from Louisiana. She was a sharecropper. And they came here during the 30s because the hurricane blew into Louisiana. And so the white sharecroppers started hanging all the black males. In order to save my uncle, they moved out of Louisiana to save the black male children. So they got here a little bit earlier before the war. Because I've been working for about now Jeez. During the strike, let me go back a little bit. I've been part of in environmental science since 1970. Uh, I was fortunate and influenced since I was on the Presidium uh, with Raymond and a few other guys. Uh, we, I was, let me see, Ron Harris was also in the chem class. 
And I happen to have been fortunate enough to have the head of chemistry division be my instructor. And that we turned around with discussions with him after class and he saw that I had a gift in chemistry because I used to make moonshine in high school. I got straight A in organic chemistry. <laughs> Ran track and then three days later, boom, bring the orange juice, brother, it's on. We cutting this 180 proof down to 90 and I ain't gonna feel no pain running across country. Uh, that two mile run, I won't feel no pain. But I went on to state and they saw that I had a gift and so rather than doing a boring ass final, they turned, he turned to me, Bryant Ramsey, head of the graduate division said, well what do you want to do for a final project? Well I want to analyze cigarette smoke because that was the big fad. And I actually, he taught me how to do uh, separation of uh, neutrals bases. I did thin layer, uh, layered, pro I came up with about 60 compounds. And with that, the following semester, I became his research assistant, and we created the class Chemistry in the Human Environment. So we went out into the Sunnydale projects, and then went and got hamburger meat from the stores, because what good is it to do this knowledge here if you don't make it part of your community? You don't need a damn PhD or an MD to save human lives. So that we went and got hamburger meat from out of the projects. Uh, that store is still there, but they can't sell any ground beef anymore. And the other store that used to be across is from the Colonel Sanders on Geneva, used to be a, a big store. Now they got apartments built up on it. We busted them and they had 70% fat in the hamburger meat. And at the other corner one, it was 55% fat. And we actually turned them in, we learned how to file and arrest and shut them. They don't do it no more and the store is gone. Uh, also, I, I learned you don't want your friends in the class that you're teaching because nobody wants to do any damn work. Uh, we did sickle cell screening before they had the shake kits and I was there until four in the morning running tests off and results of 158 people out of Sunnydale uh, Public Housing. But out of that, I also got some other brothers and sisters to get into the sciences with me. And I am still in project. The job that they had there was to determine what kills you quicker, uranium-235 or plutonium. The workers, the black workers, average life expectancy was 42 years old. Right now, as the previous speaker spoke, the life expectancy, according to the Air District, when they did a survey in 2014, released in spring, life expectancy is 14 years less for someone living in Bayview if, rather than if you lived on Russian Hill. In Oakland, it is 11 years uh, less for West Oakland, over there by the port. And in Richmond, it's nine years less living by the refineries compared to residents over there living in the Berkeley Hills. It's a life and death issue. This is no joke. Right now, if you know anybody, because right now they're pumping up and saying, oh, we want affordable housing. I'm like public enemy. Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the hype. Some of the rape, I had a team of scientists from San Francisco State, uh, Joe uh, uh, White, his daughter, Lisa White, who was then the department chair of geology, went on to be our associate dean uh, for School of Science and Engineering. Now Lisa's over there at UC Berkeley. Uh, she was part of the team. I had a faculty member uh, from the chemistry department that I was there 10 years as an associate researcher, and uh, Pete is uh, working with me. And then I had a physicist, Greg Griss, at, uh, from two colleges, um, who was also trained in radiological and hazardous waste. I'm gonna tell you now, you do not want to buy a house in Hunters Point up on the hill. I don't give a damn if they're selling it to you for 400,000, 500,000. It's appealing to the working class people in the condos. You can't plant a tree in the ground and eat the fruit off of the tree. Is that contaminated? Plumonium, the stuff that the Russians used to kill that spy and the girl that just died the other week, a couple of weeks ago, 
Remember when we were kids, you had a radium dial watch that used to glow in the dark? Well, those, they had that on the submarines and elsewhere in the paint. And that then they buried that as the black men who I had the privilege in 98 of hearing the testimony. They took that and dumped it what they call the pit. Now it's the Superfund site. And that then breaks down to what we call radon gas. And then from radon gas, and it moves through the ground. And that then it comes to polmonium, which has a half lifespan of 1,600 years. And they buried all of this in a liquid fraction zone. Meaning if you go up on a US geological report, a map, it's all red. So when the earthquake comes, not only are they going to have to try and build, pick up the pieces, they're going to be poisoned by the radiation. Now, up there at Mariner's Village, up there, on top of the hill, from 1940 to 1953, and they, uh, it was the Navy's National Nuclear Research Laboratory. And they stored radiation waste up there. And just as some of the speakers talked about gentrification, HUD came along and said, look, if any of you also want to deal about the government's policy, go back and read uh, the 84th Congressional Report on Urban Renewal and Planning, 1955. I read it when I worked for Judge Ben Travis over at Neighborhood Legal Assistance uh, over on Webster uh, Street, 721. That's when Ben, come here, little brother, I'm going to teach you how to deal with, with the law. And everybody meant Ben, that was Ben, and he had a gruffly voice, but he was a brilliant, brilliant scholar and a man of great intellect. I the, I'm very lucky. I've been around some very gifted and talented human beings through this experience. Uh, some of y'all, they're in the strike. I thought all a bunch of you was crazy. And later you sit in hindsight and you sit back Damn, we were advanced in many of our thinking, our arguments. People weren't even arguing about what we're arguing about. They ride in the coattails. And when they brought me back in 80, and some of you came to my party that I gave in 1980 over there in Daly City. I know Benny, Terry, couldn't get a hold of Jimmy. Buzz, did you make it? I was on the East Coast. Okay. I, I've learned a little diplomacy, I guess, in my old age. Because normally I'd go jump on somebody and slap the shit out of him and start a fight or two. And my buddy Ron Bentley would always tell me, Ray, big brother Ron, he was a football lineman. And Ron, I'm the skinniest one in the group, OK? Track, basketball. And, and I'd be the first one to pick up a chair and put an equalize the fight real quick. And he said, Ray, I'm going to whoop you behind if you start another fight. And we got to fight our way out of this meeting. But these reactionary dogs, you know, Brian, they talking. Ray. And we're on our way to San Luis Obispo to, because they had split the EOP program into a black and brown doing this Machiavelli crap. And that me and little, uh, we used to, uh, Pagan, we used to nickname him Che Guevara. We formulated union, we stopped off, got some liquor, got everybody happy, and there was no dispute. Because when I was a VP of the student body, we shared the money. Unfortunately, some of the communities, as the boys would call it, negritudism, we'd be fighting over pennies. And the real money, and you lose sight of your soul and what it should be about, working together. Uh, also, as you talked about the, uh, um, I'm a teamster as well, 18 years, because nobody would fund what I wanted to research. Because I want to look at genetic variances, increased susceptibility to chemical exposure, and et cetera. Uh, no, because if you ever do any of these risk assessments, the medical model is a 35-year-old white male. So that it has nothing to do with anybody in this room. And if you want to understand the insanity of science, the original breast cancer studies done in America were done on white males, not even on women. White males have less than 1% chance of developing breast cancer. So it's no wonder why Trump has a perspective as he does. I want to ask 
right now. It's nice to reminisce, but I need you to get off your behinds and get active again and speak up. Don't accept it. Right now, they are getting ready. I need you to put on our new mayor's mind. First off, they're talking about doing new scanning. It's a bunch of BS. I'm, I'm a great grandpa. Like when you send your kids up into the room and say, go get your shoes, we got to go. And they come back and say, I look, but I can't find them. Did you look under the bed? <laughs> Did you look in the closet? But I look. They're talking about surface scanning for radiation. Surface scanning only covers 6 to 12 inches. We're talking about 80 years of exposure to radiation being dumped up there. They radiated the animals and dumped them over in parcel E to make the determination. I'm listening to the testimony. When I was there in Bayview in the 90s and Dr. Gillis came up with African-American women had the highest breast cancer rate in the world. These were the descendants, our parents, who worked in that shipyard. You gotta understand A. Philip Randolph's importance. That was the first time a black man was allowed to be paid equal pay as a white male worker, although they didn't have women in there, but they had males. So when they incarcerated the Japanese in Fillmore, that was the first time, and they had to sell the property for pennies on a dollar, the workers from Bayview Hunters Point was able then to afford to build and create Fillmore out of the sorrow of the Japanese. That's how Fillmore became black. Because prior to World War II, under the earthquake, there was 1,200 African Americans in San Francisco. In 1940, there was only 5,000 African Americans. After World War II, and it was the Man Federal Manpower Commission that recruited blacks from Mississippi and Texas here in the Bay Area. And, that, and also, Rosie the Riveter, Rosie was black in the Bay Area. There was over 1,000 black women as welders in Hunters Point and in Richmond building the Liberty Ships. Those contributing factors. Also, understand the importance of Port Chicago and the blowing up of the ship. It was the practice of the Navy to have white officers race the crews and have them to work under unsafe conditions. The two ammunition ships blew up because of this, and the black workers refused to work and under unsafe working conditions. They were then court-martialed. Even Thurgood Marshall couldn't save them. They were all found guilty. And what that sent to the black workforce at government jobs, if you don't do what you're told, you're out of here. You don't have a job, or we'll lock you up for treason. So therefore, you didn't have black workers striking on government jobs at that time. So that's the real incident. Why did they keep on? Because all the black workers who were hauling all the radiation and contamination, they were never educated. Doctor uh, told me that basically 95% of the people that have this condition never make it to the hospital. You just drop dead. And it's a hereditary factor. So again, as I also, to the rest of y'all, Please, go get your checkups. Because, no, it is, you know, John Hale Medical Society turns around and states, for women, you should start in your children at 35 getting mammograms. Gentlemen, I've buried two of my dearest partners because they didn't go get their colonoscopy because they didn't want to say that the doctor stole their wiggles on the operating table. But we need to get in there early because we know cancer is far more aggressive amongst people of color. And we have, that's part of my work I do, is I increase susceptibility to it. So the standards are based on a white male and not us. And we need an inclusion factor of all the people in America. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. So tomorrow morning, uh, there'll be a press conference at 10 a.m. at 1 Van Ness 
uh, because the human resources director, get this story, the human resources director of the city and county of San Francisco, Mickey Callahan, is refusing to provide the statistics of hiring and discharge of African American and racism in the city and county of San Francisco, which are, are supposed to be public. They're refusing to provide that to the union and to the workers to show a pattern of discrimination. So we're having a press conference tomorrow, 10 o'clock, one Van S. So our, our last speaker is gonna be Benny Stewart, the past president of the Black Student Union. Welcome, Benny Stewart. Before I begin, could I just ask everybody just to stand up and take a stretch? Everyone, stand up, take a stretch, and my speech will only be an hour and a half. <laughs> you may be seated. Uh, it's going to be short. I, I realize that everybody's tired. And let me, let me just say, when I began the strike, my wife was pregnant. She was more so anti-movement. She was the primary breadwinner of the family. Um, I was on probation because I got in a fight that previous semester. So if I got caught during the strike, George Murray got caught later on and he had to do six months in the county jail. So I had to kind of stay on the move. I'm a person, uh, I dig impact. I like impact, you know. Um, some of the people that's introduced, Roger, uh, Judy and, 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 and Jimmy, they were my seniors. Jimmy and Judy, when I came into BSU, they were already there, so I was kind of learning from them. Maybe different from them, I came out the corporate world. I worked for Wells Fargo um, down on 51st Street. They tore that building down, and uh, I was into data uh, data processing and commercial loans. So that's straight up capitalism. But I wanted to get some history, and so I gave up that job for the worst job in the bank, which was working graveyard in the mailroom. But I could get some black history, and that's what I had to do. Um, so with that said, as we evolving and going on, let me, let me just say this out of all this being said. I want you to know that my comrades, my brothers, partners, uh, Roger, Ray, Jimmy. Jimmy influenced me. He was my mentor who started out with me. I take my hats off to them because 50 years later, we're meeting, and you know what we're meeting about? We're struggling. Part of it is to tell the history. This is part of it. We want to tell the history. But that's not the main part. The main part that we're struggling with is how in the hell can we be relevant to students today? That's, that's what we're really struggling with. How can we be re relevant? To break that down to another level, what that means is, what can we give them that can help them in the situation? Understand they are starving students. I had to have them break that down. Now, a lot of us were starving, and the members of the BSU, uh, we liberated our food, but we wasn't really starving. You know what I'm saying? There's, uh, I won't give up his name, but there's a particular person that's in the group. You know how they have the, um, the fast track stickers when you go to the supermarket? They made that for that person. Because we used to go to Safeway and we was getting $60 worth of groceries paying $12. 
Now, those who was doing that, they know who I'm talking about. We, we would go and get that and move on, and that's how we made it. And then some was so good with sleight of hands, uh, we didn't really pay nothing for our books. We went through the bookstore, but see, I couldn't do it because my visibility was too high. But I had other people, that's how we got our books. The point of the matter is, with most of us during our time, we had an attitude, okay? The police was tougher than us. Before they had SWAT, they had the tax squad, right? Technical alert. These were big football goons that carried AR-15s around with them in the, in the trunks of their car. We had to go up against that. I think one of the biggest peak days that we went through at State is that we had to deal with a thousand police. Now, we did a paradigm thought. Came up with, if they got all these police here, why do we have to take them on now? What's the rush? So we'd have them stand up, burn all that overtime money, and we'd send the cutest girl that we had, black or white, to go politicize that person. See, because the cop was a worker and he was trying to get through school, and we would begin the conversation of, what are you doing here? What are you trying to do? We're trying to do something for you. The attitude that we had was to confront, figure out, and attack your adversary. Now, we live in a day and time where the players are much different, and they're much more treacherous. They're much more treacherous, which means that we as a people, we have to bring that attitude. And, and let me just tell you one thing. You start out, you can't figure it out. When you start, you can't figure it out. But that ain't the point. The point is, is that you're going to do something. You're going to do something. Now, when you look at the strike, you know what we did? We said, we ain't going to go sit down in no buildings and wait on them to beat us. No. We're going to have a protracted struggle. When we can't go no more, we'll shut it down. We'll go another day. We'll go another day. And they couldn't deal with that. They hadn't confronted that. Now, there's a time to where we have to come up with something that beats Trump. First of all, we have to be durable to outliving, because eventually he's going to go. Eventually he's going to go. But in turn, what we really have to fight against is the spirit of discouragement. The spirit of discouragement. We have to fight against that. And the best way to fight against that is that we have to be with each other and tell each other that regardless, we can make it. We will make it. And don't let it stop at not being able to figure out just what to do. Okay? Because you're dealing with these old timers we didn't spend your time maybe giving boring uh, uh, speeches. But you're looking at somebody that took on 50 years ago what was out there. We didn't know we was going to win and do this, but we had an attitude. And the attitude, come what may, we're going to make it. The other thing impact about Terry that I like is that he kept me from going to Vietnam. He kept others from going to Vietnam, him and Speedy. It had an impact on us. And before I sit down, let me just say this. Let's look for the impact. The impact. Whatever we can impact to make us stronger, to deal with reaching our goals, that's what we're going to do. And in the meantime, uh, Roger, Terry, he's in his start in 80s. I'm 74. Can I imagine that? We meet maybe every two, 
uh, Saturdays, Fridays, and we are trying to figure out what can we do, because we don't know if these young people want to hear what we're talking about. Roger brought that up. What makes us think what we did 50 years ago is an interest to them. So the number one thing of organizing is addressing who you're trying to deal with as to what's going on and what's important to them in OW. Now, not yesterday, we don't know what the future, but now. And that's what I want to leave you with. That's what we want to deal with. And I hope you're happy. I've tried to have the shortest speech that I can have so we can all go home and rest. And I would like to thank most of you for coming out and listening to us. And because the people that I have been allowed to work with the past 50 years, I'm so humbled and so thankful that I was able to work with them and also learn. I learned so much from you guys. I don't know if you learned anything from me but I learned a lot from you guys. And I, I wanna say this, I really appreciate what y'all have done. And in closing, let me say this. When you look at us, you saw us on the picture. We were 50 years, we were young, boy. We was, we was going forward. But you know what? We hadn't hit suffering. We hadn't done a long time. We hadn't the face where you can't get a job no more because of your record. It's a lot of those issues that was put on us that you can't see. And then a lot of money and manpower has been used to keep us from working together. So Buzz, he's got to go over to the unions. Uh, Judy, she's going to teach at Laney. I'm going to work out in the community under urban renewal. If you've ever been to Marin City and you notice how it was built. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And you saw a revitalization of that. That was part, not me, but that's part of the team that I was on, $100 million. And I'd be honest, I had to learn a lot of capitalism because there's a whole bunch of devils, a whole bunch of devils in the details. And I spent five years fighting them devils. But I won. Thank God. All right, so I think I only did about... 10 minutes, right? I know you're all disappointed. All right, thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight, and I think we had a great opportunity to hear brothers and sister talk about the struggle and the lessons for today. And I have to say, the future of young people, they have to fight. They have to take up the fight because if they don't, they will be destroyed. We will all be destroyed. So we're fighting for the future and young people have to learn the lessons of the past to take this struggle forward. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you.